an exploration of Blackheath and Greenwich is one of the best walks in London. Blackheath and Greenwich were two villages originally in Kent to the southeast of London. The most famous Roman road in Britain, Watling Street, passed through this area and its route from London to Dover, suggested here in red, can still be more or less traced along the line of Old Dover Road and Shooter's Hill. To this day, Greenwich, where some Roman ruins have been found, can fairly be described as the area to the north of this ancient road, while Blackheath lies to its south. Like Chiswick, Richmond and Kew, other villages outside London which were on or close to the river, Blackheath and Greenwich began to fill up in the 18th century, with families looking for rural calm close to the town. In his tour through the whole island of Great Britain, published in 1724, Daniel Defoe wrote of Greenwich, Here several of the most active and useful gentlemen of the late armies are retired, having thus chosen this calm retreat. Blackheath and Greenwich were fashionable then, and they are fashionable now. Of course, both have now been swallowed up by London. Greenwich is now one of London's three royal boroughs, in fact. But they both retain their village atmospheres, and there is plenty of history to discover in both places. I started my walk in Blackheath. Partly because there is more to do in Greenwich, which I wanted to save for the end of the walk. Partly because it is an easier walk heading down to Greenwich than it is heading up to Blackheath and partly because I wanted to get the boat back to London in the evening. Blackheath is easily reached by a train from London. The journey from Victoria is a little under half an hour, while trains from London Bridge take just over 12 minutes. The railway station, designed by George Smith, the architect who also designed Greenwich Railway Station, as well as St Paul's School and Gresham College in the City of London, was built in 1847. It is now a Grade 2 listed building and it sits right in the heart of pretty Blackheath Village. If you turn right coming out of the station and walk two minutes up the hill from here, you will come to Blackheath Halls. Built in 1895 by William Webster, it is perhaps the oldest surviving concert hall in London. It was used not just for concerts but also for public meetings and lectures. At various times, suffragettes rallied here, or people flocked to hear Sir Ernest Shackleton speak. Apparently, they even came to listen to that old windbag and fan of Stalin, George Bernard Shaw. Well, it takes all sorts, doesn't it? Following an unsettled period in its history, the halls reopened as a concert venue in 1985, and it is now run by the Trinity Laban Conservatoire of Music and Dance, which is based in Greenwich, serving as their main concert and rehearsal venue. Instead of heading for the halls, though, I turned left onto the wonderfully yet misleadingly named Tranquil Vale. Tranquil Vale is one of three actually very busy roads, the others being the grandly named Royal Parade and Montpellier Vale, which together bound Blackheath Village Centre. It's a shame that the three roads make the village into something of a glorified roundabout, squashing everyone onto narrow pavements, but the centre does still have the feel of a historic village. The most direct route to Greenwich is to head for the unmissable spire of Benjamin Ferry's All Saints Church, standing proudly, if a little lonesome, on the heath itself. This church built in 1859 in the Victorian Gothic style, feels very different to the majority of houses, built in 18th century styles, which surround the heath. From here, it's a short and easy walk across the heath to Greenwich Park. But if you do this, you actually miss some of the best things to see in Blackheath. For example, if you turn right onto Montpellier Row and then right again at the Princess of Wales pub, it brings you on to South Row. Here, in the southeast corner of the heath, you'll find the Paragon, a development of seven pairs of four-storey houses in a crescent, linked by six bay Doric colonnades and framed at either end by two small lodges. Designed by Michael Searles, they're all Grade 1 listed and it's hard to think of anything else quite like it in London. A short two-minute walk from here 
On St German's Place is Morden College, another Grade One listed building. This was built some 100 years before the Paragon by the brilliant Mason Edward Strong Sr., almost certainly to Sir Christopher Wren's designs. It was founded at a cost of some £10,000 by Sir John Morden, a merchant, as almshouses for decayed Turkey merchants, and it remains in use as an almshouse to this day. It is then not only a fine illustration of 17th century domestic architecture, but also a fantastic example of an abiding charitable tradition. I wanted to head to the northwest side of the heath, so I carried on up Tranquil Vale and turned left into Heron Billet Road, passing the Heron Billet Pub, an old coaching inn, on my left. In this corner of the heath there is also plenty to see. If you cross over Blackheath Hill Road, you reach Point Hill, and from here, some 125 feet above sea level, there are commanding views of London, Kent, Surrey, and even Essex. Also on this side of the main road is Chesterfield Walk, where you can see Rangers House and McCartney House. Rangers House was built in the 1720s as a private residence for Admiral Francis Hosier. After his death, the house was occupied by a succession of aristocrats and royals until it passed into public ownership at the beginning of the 20th century. Now it is managed by English Heritage and it is home to the Werner Collection, one of the greatest private art collections in Europe, assembled by a Julius Werner, a German-born businessman. Next door to this is McCartney House, which was described by its owner, General Edward Wolfe, as, quote, the prettiest situated house in England. Edward was father to General James Wolfe, who had a distinguished military career, recognised as a brilliant tactician who fought in Europe, at Culloden and in North America. He was famously killed in 1759, leading his army to victory over the French outside Quebec, a scene immortalised by Benjamin West in 1770. Wolfe was buried in the parish church of St Alphage in Greenwich, and he is remembered with a statue which stands in Greenwich Park, looking down over the village in which he spent most of his youth. I wanted to head to this side of the heath, however, to remember another leader of men, but one from a much lowlier background. At its end, Heron Billet Road is crossed by Wat Tyler Road. Tyler, who came either from Kent or Essex, was the most famous leader of the Peasants' Revolt in 1381. This revolt broke out in Essex over the collection of a third poll tax in four years. Disorder soon spread across southeast England, and on the 12th of June, rebels amassed here on Blackheath. When medieval chroniclers attempt to guess the number of men in armies, we should always treat these figures with some caution. But I think we can believe the contemporary reports of a peasant army numbering in the tens of thousands. And when you stand and look over the 267 acres of Blackheath, it is easy to imagine them gathered here, preparing to swoop down on London and take the city. However many rebels there were in 1381, it is clear that this was neither the first nor the last time that masses with designs on London had gathered here on the Heath. In 1011, the Heath hosted a Danish army that would, one year later, murder the Archbishop of Canterbury, St Alphage, just down the hill in Greenwich. In the later Middle Ages, Jack Cade, also commemorated with a street name here, Thomas Falkenberg and Lord Audley would also all lead rebel armies gathered together on Blackheath. While in 1708-9, thousands of Protestant refugees from Germany were housed here in tents. High above London and crossed east to west by the road which connects London with Dover, Blackheath is a natural rendezvous point. Indeed, many meetings of a happier nature have taken place here too. Kings Richard II and Henry VIII met brides here, and King Henry IV met Manuel Palaeologus, Emperor of Constantinople, on the heath also. When Henry V returned to London, after his victory at Agincourt in 1415, and when Charles II came back to England upon the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, 
thousands of Londoners came to Blackheath to greet their monarchs. John Evelyn wrote that Charles was greeted at Blackheath by soldiers brandishing their swords and shouting with inexpressible joy. The ways strewn with flowers, the bells ringing, the streets hung with tapestry, the fountains running with wine. The Heath has always been a popular place for fairs also, and each year fairs continue to be held here, as to our festivals and the annual fireworks display on Guy Fawkes Night, which can attract as many as 100,000 people. In addition, tens of thousands gather here each April for the start of the London Marathon. Some people will tell you that Blackheath takes its name from the fact that it was used as a burial ground for plague victims, either during the Black Death in the middle of the 14th century or during the plague of 1665. This is, however, something of an urban myth. This area of what was then Kent was known as Blackheath long before either of those two terrible mortalities. It is more possible that the heath was described as black or bleak, meaning that it was somewhat barren or unproductive as pastoral land. Although the heath is a beautiful open space in London, it certainly can feel quite bleak and windswept on a winter's day, and on rainy evenings it does not take too much imagination to conjure up images of the highway robbers who used to stalk travellers on the road from London to Dover. This was, of course, a scene memorably captured by Charles Dickens at the start of A Tale of Two Cities, in which the Dover mail coach lumbers up the hill on a cold, misty night, with a guard armed to the teeth with a blunderbuss, half a dozen pistols and several swords. No wonder that the road is to this day known as Shooter's Hill Road. By Dickens' time, London was expanding in every direction, and the green fields in and around the city were being swallowed up for housing. Blackheath was one of several open spaces, along with Hampstead Heath, Victoria Park, Clapham Common, Tootin Beck, Epping Forest and others, which were therefore acquired by the Metropolitan Board of Works, in the middle of the 19th century, and preserved as open spaces for the recreation of Londoners. From Wat Tyler Road, I walked along Shooter's Hill before bearing left onto Charlton Way, which brought me to the southern entrance to Greenwich Park. The park was first enclosed, probably as a ground for hunting and hawking, in the 15th century, when Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, built a mansion here by royal licence. The land subsequently reverted to the crown, and for some 200 years, Greenwich was the site of a royal palace, known as the Palace of Placientia. It was here that Henry VIII and his two daughters, Mary and Elizabeth, were born, and Henry married Catherine of Aragon and Anne of Cleves here too. The royal connection remains to this day. The park is one of eight royal parks in London, and there is even a small deer population in the modern park, which reminds us of its former use as a hunting ground. Passing through this gate, you come onto the grand tree-lined Blackheath Avenue. If you look behind, you can see the spire of All Saints Church centred on the avenue, while ahead lies one of the best, if not the best viewing spot in London. At the end of Blackheath Avenue, where stands a statue of James Wolfe, you have a beautiful panorama of London. To the east is the O2 Arena and the industrial might of Greenwich Power Station. Directly ahead is a wonderful vista of the towers of London's Docklands, with the gleaming 17th and 18th century buildings of historic Greenwich below. Between the old and the new snakes of River Thames flowing west from London, and some nine miles of the London borough of Greenwich, the most of any London borough, front onto the river. The view from here to St Paul's Cathedral is one of several protected views in London. That is to say that no building can obstruct the view of St Paul's from here, and we can see the dome of the cathedral rising through the smoke above London in William Turner's 1809 painting, London from Greenwich Park. 
Turner even added his own verses to describe the scene he had painted. At that time, there were still green fields between London and Greenwich. Now, of course, thanks to the monstrous, irregularly shaped buildings which now dominate the City of London skyline, this beautiful view of St Paul's has been completely overshadowed and diminished. Originally, a building known as Duke Humphrey's Tower stood on this high point, but that was torn down on the orders of King Charles II in 1675. In its place, Charles gave orders that the first royal observatory should be built on this spot for the use of the first astronomer royal, John Flamsteed. The buildings were designed by another famous astronomer, Sir Christopher Wren, and until 1948 they were the home of the Royal Observatory. This was Britain's first state-funded scientific institution, and it is no coincidence that it was located here. In 1513, King Henry VIII had founded the Royal Naval Dockyards at Deptford, a mile or two to the west. It became a huge site filled with wharves and yards, and it was here that in 1581, Francis Drake was knighted by Queen Elizabeth I after circumnavigating the globe in the Golden Hind. Greenwich and Deptford were maritime centres, and the observatory was founded to allow for the collection and analysis of astronomical information to aid navigation, cartography and timekeeping. Today, the world's prime meridian, that is the line marking 0 degrees longitude, passes through Greenwich, and in the yard of the observatory you'll see tourists lining up to take photos of themselves with one foot in the eastern and one foot in the western hemisphere. Today, the observatory is a museum with a planetarium to its south. Of course, from here the only way is down towards the beautiful buildings at the bottom of the hill. This was the site of the Tudor Palace. Architecturally, it was, well, typically Tudor. Here we can see polygonal towers and chimneys liberally scattered across the Gothic gabled building. There are two pairs of long oblong windows in the walls, walls which are topped with crenellations. The whole thing feels very insular and way behind the latest architectural fashions in Europe. One wonders then just what people in the early 17th century would have made of this, the first building in England to have been built in the new Palladian style, so called after the famous Italian architect and theorist Andrea Palladio. Known today as the Queen's House, it was commissioned by Anne of Denmark, wife of King James I of England, in 1616. It was designed by Inigo Jones, the first great English architect, and Sir John Summerson has argued that the construction of the Queen's House and Jones's similar masterpiece, the Banqueting House in Whitehall, ushered taste into English architecture. The Queen's House took 20 years to complete, by which time Anne had died, and the house was occupied by Queen Henrietta Maria, wife of Anne's son, Charles I. Unlike the Tudor Palace, the house is perfectly symmetrical, a quite simple arrangement of nine bays and two storeys. Instead of crenellation, it has a Renaissance balustrade round the top. On its southern elevation is a sheltering loggia, from which the Queen and her ladies could admire the park and watch riding and hunting taking place. The park was probably laid out more formally by André Le Notre, who had designed the gardens at Versailles. Inside the house, the Great Hall is a perfect cube with a beautiful black and white marble floor, and the tulip stair rises up through the building. The stair takes its name from the tulips on the ironwork of the balustrade, which is a bit unfortunate as they're probably meant to be fleur-de-lis. Be that as it may, it is a stunning piece of work, the first cantilevered spiral staircase of its kind in Britain. Nowadays, the Queen's House sits at the centre of a complex of beautiful 17th and 18th century buildings. To get the best view of the site, I walked east towards the park's boating pond 
and turned south out through the gate onto Park Row. After crossing Romney Road, Park Row heads down towards the river, where at the end sits the Trafalgar Tavern, another reminder of Greenwich's rich maritime history. The pub was built in 1837 to designs by Joseph Kay, and its iron balconies look like the galleries of a man of war. Outside is a statue of Nelson, and inside the rooms are named after heroes of the seas. It really is a fine place to stop and enjoy a drink or some food. In the 19th century, the tavern was even famous for the white bait parties held by liberal ministers of government at the close of parliamentary sessions, when white bait would be fried freshly caught from the River Thames. The path west along the river here is quite narrow and can get busy, so instead of walking along the riverfront, I turned left into College Way from Park Row. This brought me to the very centre of what is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. King William and Queen Mary made Hampton Court their chief residence, and in 1694, Wren was ordered by the Queen to complete the buildings at Greenwich as a hospital for sailors. This project has to be seen in the same light as another of Wren's buildings, that is the Royal Hospital Chelsea, which was built as a home for old and injured soldiers between 1681 and 1692 on the orders of Mary's uncle, King Charles II. Here at Greenwich, Wren, Nicholas Hawksmoor, Sir John Vanbrugh, Colin Campbell and Thomas Ripley were all involved in the designs for this enormous project, which in the end took decades to complete. By 1755, over 1,500 pensioners were housed here, and the Queen's House even became the home for the governor of the Royal Naval Hospital. It subsequently served as a school for children of the seamen pensioners, and the covered colonnades that joined the Queen's House to the hospital were actually added early in the 19th century not just to connect the buildings, but also to provide covered playgrounds for the children when it rained. The school was here until 1933, when it moved to Norfolk, but by 1869 there was less need for the hospital, as most of the pensioners lived out. So the hospital buildings were acquired by the Naval College in Portsmouth, and the site became the Royal Naval College. From 1873 to 1997, when all the teaching moved to Dartmouth in Devon, some 27,000 naval officers from across the globe were trained here. After the first Wrens were admitted to the Royal Navy in 1939, over 8,000 women trained here for service during the Second World War. Now the themes of education and naval history remain. The buildings here have variously become museums or have been acquired by Trinity Lab and the University of Greenwich. The two finest buildings here are open to the public. The first is the exquisite Neo-Grecian Chapel of St Peter and St Paul, which was rebuilt to James Athenian Stuart's plans after Wren and Ripley's chapel had been gutted by fire in 1779. The second is the Royal Hospital's main hall, originally the dining hall for the pensioners on site. It is now commonly known as the Painted Hall, or even as Britain's Sistine Chapel, thanks to Sir James Thornhill's incredible 40,000 square feet painting scheme, which adorns the ceilings and walls. Thornhill was also responsible for work at Blenheim Palace and St Paul's Cathedral, and it took him 19 years to plan and paint this extraordinary arrangement. Together, a cast of 200 characters tell a monumental story of British and indeed human history. In the southeast corner, for example, we find a celebration of scientific achievement. This scene shows John Flamsteed, the Astronomer Royal, and his assistant Thomas Weston, observing the heavens, while Flamsteed holds a sheet predicting an eclipse on the 22nd of April 1715. The main story on the West Wall is the return of peace and prosperity under the Hanoverians, but in the corner Thornhill hailed artistic endeavour and had something of a joke, for he painted a self-portrait. Here we see him standing with his tools and pointing to King George I and his family. 
The main narrative, however, is a political one, and it tells the story of the Protestant accessions to the throne, first of William and Mary, and then of George I, from which liberty and prosperity were assured, and of the concurrent emergence of Great Britain as a European power. The central scene is the triumph of peace and liberty. Riding his chariot through the heavens is Apollo, the sun god, while underneath him is a canopy. Shaded beneath the canopy sit William and Mary, fated for the bloodless success of the glorious revolution. Peace kneels to offer them an olive branch as William confers the scarlet cap of liberty on Europe. Underneath his foot is a defeated King Louis XIV of France. Boo! The supposed sun king of Europe, here personified as arbitrary power. Throughout, as is fitting at Greenwich, are references to British commercial success and naval power. It is no surprise that Nelson lay here in state before his funeral after the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. Thornhill's efforts really have bequeathed us not only a breathtaking piece of work, but also a brilliant study of a central theme in British history. There is, however, plenty more to see in Greenwich, and so I continued along College Way to arrive in Greenwich Town Centre. The market here was established almost 300 years ago and Joseph Kay, the architect behind the Trafalgar Tavern, laid out the main market buildings which we see here in 1831. I would recommend taking the time to wander through the market, which is open every day. On its far side stands the imposing and beautiful church dedicated to St Alphage, the Archbishop of Canterbury who was murdered, so legend has it, on this very spot. The church was designed by Hawksmoor and built by Edward Strong Jr., son of the mason who built Morden House, which we saw earlier in our walk. Strong Jr., who lived in Greenwich, was a good friend to Thornhill. The two men travelled together and were members of the same lodge of Freemasons. And after his death in 1741, Strong was buried in this church. Also here in the centre are Greenwich Theatre and a cinema and some beautiful streets. The grand terraced houses, mostly grade two listed on Crooms Hill and Gloucester Circus, are especially beautiful examples of late 18th and early 19th century domestic architecture. Well, Gloucester Circus was never actually completed and it is in fact only a crescent. It would also be fair to say that it What was built on the other side rather lets the whole thing down. My final stop was at the Cutty Sark. I hardly need give directions to this famous old ship. Standing over 150 feet tall and with 11 miles of rigging, she towers over Greenwich Town Centre. The Cutty Sark was a ship built for speed. You can still see that in her sleek form. She was launched in Dumbarton in 1869 and she was soon outpacing almost all her rivals on the run back from China laden with tea. Subsequently, she achieved greater fame as the fastest ship on the wall run from Australia. By the end of the 19th century, however, the increasing use of steamships meant that she was less profitable, but she still had some go in her. In 1889, she even overtook the P&O steamship Britannia, which was travelling at about 15 knots. After various adventures, the Cutty Sark was brought here to Greenwich in 1954, where she sits in a dry dock, looking out to the river directly in front of her. If you've finished exploring Greenwich, from here you have several choices. You can catch a DLR train from Cutty Sark or the train from Greenwich Station. Both are very close. There is plenty to see on the other side of the river too, on the Isle of Dogs, and some nice walks through some of London's oldest and greatest docks. To get there, you walk 1,200 feet under the Thames through the Greenwich Foot Tunnel. The tunnel, completed in 1902, was built to allow dockers who lived in South London to get to their places of work at Millwall and West India docks. Now, of course, the docks are no longer filled with ships unloading their cargoes, but the tunnel is still used by thousands of commuters travelling to and from Canary Wharf each day. In fact, 
Today, some 120,000 or so people work in Canary Wharf. That is, as many jobs as there were in the docks when they acted as a conduit between Britain and her empire. The tunnel is a popular leisure route for walkers and cyclists too. And there are two walks along the river heading east towards North Greenwich and west towards Deptford. But the most spectacular and indeed relaxing way to depart is to take the boat from Greenwich Pier. The journey back to London is quick and not at all expensive. You can sit down with a drink and the view back towards historic Blackheath and Greenwich. Well, it's quite simply one of the best urban views in all Europe, isn't it? <laughs>